Hello, everyone. Today we have a little bit something different for the channel, but you know, it's not often we get to have people from one of our favorite developers here to talk with us. Today we have Adam Tierney. Hey, this is Adam from Way Forward. I am a director of some of our games like River City Girls, and I also handle business development and publishing at the company. Awesome. And we also have James Montagna with us. Hi there. I'm James Montagna, uh, I'm designer and director at Way Forward and uh, creator of Vitamin Connection. Uh, I've uh, directed uh, and worked on other titles. Um, I've been involved in the Shantae series as an associate director uh, ever since uh, Risky's Revenge onward. And uh, I worked on uh, Cat Girl Without Salad. Um, you directed, directed the first Adventure, uh, Time Adventure Time game. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Adventure Time. Hey, Ice King, why'd you steal our garbage? I directed that one. Um, I love that uh, title, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a mouthful. <laughs> So thank you both for coming on to speak with us today. It's much appreciated. Of course. How this is going to work is we're going to start with me and then we'll kind of rotate between uh, myself, John and Ted, just kind of asking some fun questions about, you know, things you want to know about going on at WayForward in certain games. So I think I'll start with uh, a question for Adam. So mm -hmm. River City Girls is definitely a very different take for the River City franchise on the whole. Was there any particular inspiration in the way you took it or kind of was there some sort of like Oh, we want to do something really different from like Arc System and stuff. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of a lot of different things. So, I mean, the seed of it was, well, I've always loved River City, um, uh, Ransom, the original game, and Double Dragon. I grew up on those. And I wasn't, um, I, but, you know, they've had over, well, actually, I think, I think River City Girls might be the 50th game. It's something like that. But they've had about 50 games over the past 35 years, I believe. And one of them was a Super Famicom game that James introduced me to called uh, uh, Kunio Tachi no Banka. And it's, I believe, the last game that was done by the original crew from uh, Double Dragon and uh, and um, Kunio Kun, the River City Ransom series. And it was really cool in that it had the main characters that you usually have, which is Kunio and Ricky, but it also starred their girlfriends at the time, Masako and Kyoko. And I just thought they looked amazing in the game. They are you know animated very cute and they're just you know curb stomping and they're like super aggressive and everything and so it felt very way forwardy even though it was this 1994 game i believe and so uh around that time which is a couple of years ago we were starting to reach out to japanese companies and so we thought oh this would be a cool game to do something based on so we basically come up with the came up with the idea of doing a game based on those two girls in particular, Masako and Kyoko, and uh, went to Japan, pitched it to uh, Arc System Works, who now owns the IP, and they liked it, and we liked it, and, and shortly thereafter, we kind of dove in and started working on it. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as like it being such a, a departure, and I think in Japan, they actually call it like Kunio, it's like called Kunio Kun Gaiden or something. It's like a side story. Um, it was you know, partly just wanting to do something in the way forward style. And also because there are so many Kunio Kun games and because it's, it's such a unique series in that, you know, decades later, they're still using those original NES sprites. We wanted to do something where it was visually very different um, partly creative, but also partly from a business standpoint, like this will stand out. So there's no confusion that you might have already played this one. This one is going to feel totally different. And uh, yeah, man, it, I mean, it came out and, and really just resonated with fans. So we're, we're super happy with it. Yeah, I really like the game. I've, I've played through it a few times, actually. So uh, really looking forward to future news. So uh, I guess, John, your turn to ask a question. Uh, sure. Uh, this is for James. Uh, going uh, outside of Shantae, because I feel Shantae is the easy grab uh, as both a creator and gamer uh, which game under your belt would you consider one of your favorites that you worked on or one of you just like to play that you would immediately recommend to others either your peers or just anybody that asked you that question out of everything i've worked on outside of the shantae series um oh i'll, I'll tell you that one first I, I love pirate's curse that one's really special uh but outside of the shantae series um i think a game i'd really like more people to try uh would be vitamin connection uh, it's the most recent one we just finished. Um, I think uh, it's really best played uh, with a partner. And, you know, the timing of release, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're uh, in this global pandemic right now. It's still ongoing. Uh, it's very difficult to get to, together with people, um, which, you know, that, that the timing of the release of, of a game where you want to be in person together and, and play uh, is uh, it's a little bit tricky. But um, if you can find a partner to enjoy this game with, I uh, 
I totally recommend it. It's um, it, it is the most recent one that we released, and it's um, something that was made uh, from the ground up to kind of use the platform of Nintendo Switch to the fullest and take advantage of everything it has to offer. Um, it was a really fun game to develop, and there was a lot of uh, just creative freedom to get really quirky and weird and just ha have a good time making this game. And I think the fun that we had making that game, it's just like dripping with that essence everywhere. And when you play it, uh, I I feel that, um, and I've been told that it, it comes through. So uh, of all the stuff I've worked on, you know, there's, there's a lot of great stuff there. I also recommend Cat World Out Salad, and it's very difficult to just pick one. Um, you know, I. Maybe it's the bias of it being the most recent, but I, I'd love more, for more people to check out Vitamin Connection. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I mean, every director at WayForward, whatever we're working on, we put our own spin on it. So like when James did Adventure Time, it's Adventure Time, but it has a little bit of James Montagna in it. But definitely, I think Vitamin Connection is kind of the most pure inside your brain experience, like four LP, <laughs> massive soundtrack, just super quirky kind of Japanese style. It, 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 I think that's that game uh, feels the most on brand to you as a director i think, <laughs> I think that's gotta right. suck though like you make this game that you you recommend like local co-op to get the best experience and literally a pandemic happens soon after like god hates me <laughs> <laughs> you know the it's it's funny we i mean we obviously couldn't have predicted this in the game um thematically being about uh you know, uh, illness and v vitamins and you're fighting, I mean, granted, it's not a virus, but it's bacteria. Yeah. Um, the, the timing uh, was just very uh, funny uh, in, in certain ways. It's not, not haha funny, but, um, it, you know, it was, it, it ended up being just kind of a, a, a strange coincidence. But my hope is that this game about fighting uh, illness and bacteria, the timing of it can also be something where uh, people play it and feel uh, a little empowered or hopeful about, you uh, you know, fighting back not only like individual illness, but you know, illness in the world. It's like a, I, I hope like it can be like received as something uh, empowering in a time where a lot of people don't feel powerful or are, are stricken with uh, the results of uh, such a horrible thing to happen to the world. So yeah, that's, that's just my hope. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, so my questions for Adam, actually, it was sort of half answered a little bit earlier, but um, uh, Way Forward is known for doing a lot of, t on top of doing your original games, you're known for taking pre existing properties and giving your own spin on them. River City Girls being the most recent example, uh, but also stuff like uh, Double Dragon Neon as well. Um, so you said that for River City Girls, that was you going to Arc System and talking to them. How often does it happen that way uh, versus? companies coming to you and saying we would like you to do a blood rain game or double dragon or so on and so forth um it, it shifted a little bit so i mean <clears throat> going way back way forward used to be kind of like the game in a box studio so if you went to like a walmart or a target or whatever and you saw a barbie game or a um a SpongeBob game or stuff. We were developers of a lot of those. And then what ended up happening is probably around 10 years or so ago, um, there was less demand for kind of just, hey, let's have a licensed game for everything. So we ended up shifting. And so now we're actually seeking out a lot of the games on our own and coming up with what we want to do and, and pursuing licenses. Um, so it's, it's a cool time because what that means is the games you're seeing coming out from way forward now are more kind of core game licenses or they're more actiony or they're more you know appealing to teenagers and 20 somethings not that we didn't uh you know love doing barbie games and stuff like that i always thought those were fun but i think they're like more in line with kind of the stuff that we do like shantae and, and things like that so that is becoming the norm um with like a river city that's us going after it um occasionally they do still come to us like one example was we've announced it but we haven't shown anything yet on it is uh ruby rwby the uh the anime series Series, um, CG anime series, we're working on a game of that with Rooster Teeth, the creators. That was one where they hit us up and it was basically just like, hey, you guys make games and we like your games. And and we said, oh, that's cool. We like your show. And, and it was just kind of, you know, teaming together like that. Um, but I would say it's definitely shifted the majority of opportunities now are way forward deciding, hey, let's go after this brand or hey, let's do a, a game like this and then kind of putting it together on our end. 
Oh, that's really cool because it seems like being able to come up with the concept on your own, my guess is, is that that would give you more freedom on what you want to do and that they, you would have be able to more direct it towards the kind of product that you would want to be with less pushback on, oh, no, we can't have such and such character in this kind of game. You know. Exactly. And and even even within, you know, beyond the brand, it's like the type of game too. Because what we'll do is the process, everyone's always kind of curious what the process is. We'll put together a pitch doc, which is maybe around like 20 to 30 pages of basically here's what we see for this game. So, you know, for like a Ruby game or or for a River City game or whatever, we'll say, here's what the gameplay is like, here's what the stages are like, here's how the bosses are gonna be like, we'll just list everything out. And then we'll also usually do a, like a mock-up image. Um, we should really figure out a way to like show off some of those, at least from the games that happen, because we'll basically do one really beautiful mock-up that that looks like a finished polished image if you just pause the game. And so what's cool about that is we're really determining a lot of what happens in the game at that time and that can carry over. So whether a game is 2D, whether it looks cartoony, whether it's 3D, whether it's realistic, we're kind of making some of those decisions early on. Um, and that's something that I think is very specific to when we're pitching a game. If we just get approached about a brand, like when we used to do more of the kids games, they usually come with uh, often kind of an idea in mind of the type of game they want to do. So we're more just kind of work for hire on that stuff. But yeah, definitely when, when the idea starts with us, I think that does tend to give us more control and tend to make it a, a more way forward -y project overall. That's really interesting, mostly just because uh, obviously the shift for license games has definitely changed over the years. So um, I have a question for uh, James. It's kind of something I've always been curious about regarding uh, the actual game design process. So. Now you've been a game designer in a lot of different kind of games. So do you feel it's kind of easier to design a game in a genre that you're more of a fan of or familiar with versus something you're less familiar with, which might let you experiment more rather than kind of being in your headspace of what this kind of game should be, or is it just kind of depending on the game? That's an interesting question. I think, um, you know, if, if you have a, a deep appreciation for a particular genre, I think it is, of course, easier to uh, dig into that and uh, create that sort of thing. I think if you're kind of approaching a genre that uh, you, you maybe like don't play as like your default like gaming genre, or you're intentionally trying to uh, subvert the norms of the genre, that can also lead to some very interesting results. So I, I, I feel uh, whether you're not super familiar with it in the genre as you start or if you're intentionally trying to upend the core identity of that genre uh you can get something really like fun and interesting with that perspective as well you know i i'll give you a quick example um when we were working on uh cat girl without salad uh we of course uh play a lot of shooter games and the whole core concept of that one was you're we trying to mash all these genres into one we kind of had to take a step back at like looking at things like bullet hell shooters and we had to kind of figure out what works for this specific game and sort of deconstruct the genre a little bit and uh we came out with something that uh while it is a shooter um cat girl without salad has a unique feel all its own and um so i, I think when you when you think of it uh in terms of the uh genre you're looking to explore if you either don't have familiarity with it you might accidentally come up with that sort of thing or if you're intentionally trying to like do something lateral to the norm uh you can get some pretty interesting results yeah that's really interesting just mostly because you know we're kind of inter we're kind of on the outside as content producers so i'm always cur i've always been curious to kind of what the thought process is because obviously you guys are game fans and you guys play a lot of games so i was just yeah. kind of curious how that kind of experience would go into designing a game absolutely all right, so this, this was a question for Adam. Uh, and this is regarding uh, licensed products. Do you feel there's a pressure laid on you and other developers to meticulously recreate the world of the property in question, or do you try and put your own spin on things when you can? You know, it really depends game by game. And we've really, I think, over the years, run the gamut of every possible version of that. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, I would say something like um, like our Batman game, Batman Brave and the Bold on Nintendo Wii. That was one where we were using the show's 
models. We were working directly with Warner Brothers Animation. Warner Brothers Animation did the cutscenes. <clears throat> we did a, a full VO with all the actors. And so the idea with that is like, uh, it was like, quote unquote, like play the cartoon. We wanted it to be that when somebody is just watching the game being played, they have the same sort of experience of just watching the cartoon. So that was one where it's really like, all, except for the camera perspective, it's almost 100% identical to the existing brand. Then you go on the other end of it where it's something like, a, a River City Girls, and we're using some existing characters and settings, but we're really reinventing their personalities. Where you know maybe a character that was very timid before, we're making them you know aggressive or angry or whatever. We're really um, uh, you know almost kind of hijacking the brand to do like a way forward alternate universe of it. And I really think it just kind of depends on the opportunity and also like what we think will make the best product. Um, I think when you're dealing with uh, brands that have one very singular identity, then it's hard to maybe deviate from that if it's um, a really established company. So an example is like Troll Hunters, you know, we did the Troll Hunters game a while back, um, Guillermo del Toro's Netflix series. It is exactly, it knows exactly what it is visually and tone wise and, and, you know, aesthetically. And so I don't think there was really that much, uh, leeway to go in a different direction with that because it was just living up to what he had set up with the show. But then with something like River City Girls, because there'd been so many games with so many creators, or even a better example would be something like if we do a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game, there have been like, you know, 20 or 30 different iterations of the turtles. So there's a lot more flexibility for way forward to either put our own spin on it or cherry pick which elements we want from each of those things. So, um, you know, I, I think, uh, and, and it's really not even consistent, I think, you know, per creator or within way forward. Like I've done games that are very, very faithful and then games that kind of just take a glance at the source material and say, yeah, hey, I got it, I got it, let's do our own thing. Um, it, it's sort of just a gut check thing. You kind of just look at the opportunity and um, I think like a lot of creators, I don't, um, I would assume it works the same for James. A lot of the decisions I make as a design director, I don't know why I make them or where they come from. It's just kind of what pops into your head, what gets you excited and, and what feels right. Yeah, it's instinct. I, I would uh, to, to that point, you can kind of get a pretty good idea of what the constraints of the brand are just by delving into it. And, be, you know, everything we work on, we become obsessively interested in whatever the brand it is. You know, we we research uh, it and we become uh, that mega fan status ourselves. So I think that yeah perspective like kind of helps us know like what the guidelines of the brands are and we know how far we can push things too yeah and i think that's <laughs> can also I give kind barbie of... a gun <laughs> <laughs> that, so that's that is a tough one because we did i think we did four barbie games i was involved in three of them and one of the tough things with barbie is you need enemies and how do you do enemies when you know she's not supposed to kill things so a lot of you got to think creatively you got to think like okay well she, the the animals are scaring her or she's scaring them or you know because you can't just have people like wall up each other or you know they'll be like attacking with like a frying pan but not a sword or you know it, you, you really have to think about that and i think a lot of it also um you know this kind of ties into it a little bit is the structure at way forward i think is different than most studios i i freelance for a few places before i went to way forward and I think a lot of studios are very top down in terms of you have like the creative director at the top and then all the directors are kind of taking the creative director's vision and everybody knows what the game is. And, and I've done games as a freelancer where we're just all working from, you know, spreadsheets and it's like there's not that much kind of, you know, experimentation with way forward. The way that we tend to do it is we'll assign a director. And that person is like the visionary for the game. Um, they're always the designer, they're the director, they're often the art director, they're often the writer, they're VO director, cinematics director, they help with level design. Like it's usually our games do have typically one person who is like the core visionary. And I think um, that approach, which I've been told is maybe a little more Japanese than, than, uh, uh, than commonly in, in the West, I think that allows us to have quirkier, weirder, more interesting design decisions, as opposed to if, if our studio had more of like a design by committee sort of approach. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, on that kind of note, uh, this question was for James. Um, Cause one of the defining aspects of many way forward games is it has this really offbeat and very specific sort of brand of humor. Um, and I just have to wonder where do you come up with stuff like 
when you find the babies in Mighty Switch Force and you punt them off the screen, shouting <laughs> you're safe, where you very clearly kick that baby in the stomach. <laughs> or uh, the, the dialogue in Shantae is always something that also made me make me laugh. Like the kid in, uh, I forget which one it is, but he says, I can skip conversations by pressing plus. I'm a rude dude. Like where does all of this, um, that specific way forward brand of humor come from? Is it a group kind of thing? Does Do you guys just f think of something you think is funny and put it in? Or is there a process or does it just happen? Uh, you know, there's certainly not a science to it, but I, I think what you're, you're feeling there is like our true uh, inner uh, quirkiness and humor coming through. Like, I, I think that's uh, probably just when, when you read lines like that, it's a deep look at who we are and how we uh, how we joke with each other. Like, as we're just, we're, we're just dorks. Studio. All the yeah, directors pretty much. Dorks. <laughs> like, so, every yeah. single one of us. Yeah, we, we all just, I, I think every single one of us has our own sort of like brand of like weird dorky humor. So I, I, you, you're just kind of, you're just sensing that way forward essence uh, in truth there. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's, I think it's been exacerbated now that we've started in the past decade diving into VO because now we can be even dorkier and sillier. Oh, no doubt. And we can yeah. actually hear the characters. <laughs> Yeah, because one of my favorite things when playing through River City Girls is hearing uh, hearing them talk to each other. Like, sometimes I would stop paying attention to the fighting during the sections where they're talking over each other just to hear them, like, chat with each other, which I don't do an awful lot for many other games. Like, if there's cutscenes going on during the action, I'm usually tuning that out because I need to keep playing. But I would, like, stand in a corner to make sure I could hear what they... <laughs> But they were both the same. So yeah, we we would call that passive VO. We have like you know four right. or five different types of of uh, cinematics in that game, and and uh, where I got that was I was just talking with one of the, our other directors, Tom, recently about this. Is um, the very first Shenmue game on Dreamcast, which I guess would have been like ninety nine or two thousand. Right. I remember playing through that, and there's this part at the end of the game where you're fighting a bunch of thugs and your rival is fighting the thugs with you. And while you're fighting the thugs, all of a sudden you and your rival start smack talking each other. And it was just like, it broke my brain. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is happening? Like, like this isn't a cinematic, they're just fighting. And they're like, like, hey, nice takedown. Like, you know, and they're kind of mocking each other and stuff. And it's, you know, it was just such an eye-opening moment. I think that was the first one. And the second one for me was Portal, of course, with like the, you know, beautiful GLaDOS uh, uh, VO that they had in that game. But I love the idea of running passive VO stuff where you can have that level of charm, but it doesn't inter, inter, uh, interrupt the gameplay. And then also the fun of like anticipating what the player is going to see and playing off that. Like one of my favorite moments that was in Cat Girl where um, uh, that James and I co-directed was at one point the the Squiddy guy is like talking to Kabako, the main character, and saying, okay, like, you know, be on the lookout for like a, a giant space cow. That's how you know that, that, you know, we're almost to where we're going to go. And she's like, I got it. Like, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. And then in the background, you see the cat, cow start floating <laughs> by. Slowly, <laughs> slowly <laughs> floating by. And then he's like, because, you know, when you see it, that'll let us know Know where you that we're almost there and she's like can do i got it and she never acknowledges it and that's one of those like uh you know uh, off screen on screen moments where you can just picture the players saying like it's right there and like screaming at the tv <laughs> so yeah we, we love that just sort of goofiness and then i think you know also just from a practical standpoint um vo is one of the easiest things to do humor is one of the easiest things to do because if we could just you know write something um get in the studio coordinating with our our you know amazing talented uh, uh, VO director and casting director, Christina V. Um, it's easy to just drop in sound files into a game and just, it just um, you know, pack them with, with jokes and stuff. Versus if you're gonna try and do something more cinematic, um, that's a lot of coordination between camera work and models and animation and all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, I, 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 the more that I go forward on my games, the more I lean into that passive VO stuff and, um, and just in general, letting the player have the charm of the game without having to stop playing the game to experience it. If I had to kind of just like tack on one more thought about the humor of our games, I think some of the best ideas start out with a person saying, wouldn't it be stupid if dot, 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 and whatever that next <laughs> thing they say. <laughs> All right, if I may somewhat follow up on kind of that train of thought for a question for Adam. Uh, 
you know, you're the being the director of kind of River City Girls, there's a lot of crazy and kind of out there stuff happening over the course of the game. Obviously, WayForward, as we just talked about, has kind of the really own brand of humor, but have you ever kind of had to manage the crazy ideas and say, okay, maybe we're going a little bit too far, or if we try this, maybe our system might get mad at us if we actually put it in or something like that? Not too much because I think, well, one, I think way forward tends to be fairly PG rated unless it's appropriate to not be. So, I mean, we'll do when we've done games like um, Blood Rain or Aliens or um, uh, Silent Hill, um, you know, we get more into like the T or the M rated territory. But I think most of what we do is 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 fairly PG ish and kind of goofy. So we don't really have that much that pushes the boundaries in regard to that. And then I think, you know, since we usually have the person writing the game as the director, they usually have that vision of what it is. Um, so I can't think of too much. I remember like with River City Girls in particular, there was a few instances where, uh, well, actually, yeah. So there's one really good example, which is the ending. Um, you know, the ending, uh, I won't spoil it here, but basically the, there was the ending to the game um, was we some people thought like oh that's a little mean or it's a little bit kind of you know mean spirited and for us it we, it made sense with the tone of it but that was something that art kind of called out like oh like maybe you know maybe you want to dial that back a little bit so what we ended up doing ultimately is we have a second ending if you like do the completionist um, stuff and really get everything you could possibly do again i won't spoil exactly what you do but there's two endings and that other ending was the more kind of upbeat more satisfying one so that was one where we ended up adding that um, partly based on kind of like, oh, you know, maybe this one landed a little bit darker than we anticipated. I still like the ending um, and I still think it's in line with the characters and kind of what you're doing up to that point. That was more of an instance of like, um, oh, this kind of got received a little bit differently than, than we initially anticipated. And so we kind of looked for a little bit of a workaround to keep that, but then add something else that that would you know, uh, work otherwise. Um, beyond that, yeah, that most of the stuff though that we actually, you know, get called out for working with collaborators or IP, it's mostly the factual stuff. So like when you play through River City Girls and Kyoko says like, I don't even go to this school. Like those are lines that were added because we just had everybody going to River City High and then Ark would say, oh, well, this character is actually from this school and this character is actually from this school. And so we would have to rewrite little lines like that. Um, but it's funny because actually, yeah, some of those, like especially that one where she says, I don't even go to the school, that always gets a huge laugh when people play it on Twitch. And it was just such a throwaway line that was like meant to uh, erase the fact that I didn't do my homework and I didn't know where all the kids are actually going in the in the lore of that series. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was, it's something I was always kind of curious about because as you mentioned with the ending, sometimes jokes or ideas don't land quite the way you expect them to when you actually show them to other people. So that was kind of interesting to hear that. For the most part, things go pretty well over there. So, Yeah, the big thing that I learned in River City Eagles is um, because when we started it, uh, the idea is that um, Masa Saku and Kyoko are, are not that bright. I mean, they're lovable, but they're just kind of, you know, a pair of knuckleheads. And so the ending for me was like, oh, of course that's what would happen. But what I did not count on is once people have played through their lives for, you know, six to eight hours or so, and, you know, especially when you get such amazing performances from uh, Kaylee and Kira as them, people fell in love with them. And so it's like, okay, it doesn't matter that I wrote them as kind of, you know, you know, little dum-dums um they really want to see them succeed and they really care about them and they're real people in their mind so that was definitely a big lesson for me as a writer on a game is you know even if we're kind of going a little one note with like the goofiness of something people are going to fall in love with your character so yeah be very careful uh to do anything other than you know uh, have satisfying endings or or uh, completion of the stories for for your protagonists I appreciate not spoiling the end, by the way, because I can't beat a Bobo, <laughs> so I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> He's a little tough, yeah. <laughs> this can go to, uh, to both of you, but uh, we were talking about like having fun in the creation process and everything involved with it, but you know, I also like to get the perspective of like the least favorite part of the creation process. It could be something so innocuous, but like to you guys, like what's the little thing you really don't look forward to the most when it just comes to the idea of like designing a game or finalizing it or publishing it for that record? You want to go you know, first, James? Yeah, I, I could I could tackle this one. There, there's there's always uh, there's always going to be the ideas that you had to kind of put on the chopping block. 
I can tell you personally, I don't think I've ever had a game where something didn't have to be sacrificed in the end. We had to let that thing go. And, you know, as a game designer, every game you make, I mean, no one sets out to make like a not fun experience. You know, we want to make the best possible game every single time. Unless that's like your gimmick. You're like, oh, it's going to make you mad. Um, but no, I, I think um, we want to make sure that the game is all it can be. So I think the, the part that I don't look forward to, or, the, or I guess the most difficult part of uh, game development comes when it's time to, you know, the reality of like the business of, you know, there's deadlines and there's there's things that are outside of our control that we kind of have to, constraints we need to work in and things we need to do where uh, sometimes things don't go as planned. And when that happens, the best thing you can do is make the most of it, work in what you can, make sure that what's in there is cohesive and, and good. and take any misgivings you have about the thing not being exactly what you had set out to be and just fold that energy into the next project. That's uh, that's the best thing you can possibly do with it. But you know, when that time comes, it's, uh, it's always challenging to let go. Yeah, I was gonna say the exact same thing. Um, it's, I've always felt that you never really finish a game, you just run out of time. And then as you get closer and closer to the end date, you're like, okay, well, I can live without this or I'll rethink this. I mean, some of those things create new, you know, creative solutions, but yeah, I mean, like with River City Girls, that was one where I, we actually got most of what I wanted in there, but we had this really cool little sequence at one point where toward the end of the game where Masaka would get knocked out and then it flashes back to her being a little girl and there's just like a little girl like you know five-year-old version of Masako in a field of flowers with pretty music playing and you know you're like I don't know what's going on and then suddenly you realize you can control Masako the little girl and so you start running through the flowers and we have this whole acapella song by by Megan and then um you come across like adult Masako lying down like you know mangled on the ground and basically the young version starts kicking and the crap out of each other and it, like little five-year-old versions like get up you 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 gotta keep fighting and, and you know kind of beats herself up and back into reality and then she woke uh, she woke up after that and uh, i remember the dialogue was uh she's like oh like we can we can beat this one uh uh and uh i i know because i told myself i can and kyoko's like what and it's just this weird little moment that I, you know, we had so much of it done. We had the sprites done, the animation done, the background, the music, all that stuff. But it was just, it was one thing that was just coding wise, just too much. And so we had to put it on the chopping block. Um, and so, yeah, like, like J totally what James said, that's what popped into my head is, is you have to make those little choices about what your game needs and what you can, you know, leave by the wayside. And, and that's definitely the hardest thing. And, and the tough part also is what gets in the way of that is often not the fun stuff. So it's not like, oh yeah, like we, you know, did all these enemies and, and all the cool enemies are taken long. So we have to do this. No, it'll be something like where like you spend a month just working on weird collision systems or something like that. Like sometimes it's the stuff that is the hog as far as like all of the dev time and just eats up more resources than you anticipate is a lot of like the under the hood kind of less interesting stuff. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's pretty interesting to, to hear about. And uh, I, I take it maybe uh, if uh, River City uh, Girls ever get re-released in a deluxe edition, we can uh, we can expect that flower scene to be in the that's game. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the assets, baby. Um, okay, cool. Piggybacking off that um, topic a little bit, um, which I, I should note that we didn't intend for this to happen so much. It's just been a happy coincidence. Um, what are, are there any like noteworthy features or mechanics that you really wanted to be put in any of the games you've done, but needed to be get, get cut? And if so, did any of them end up ever coming back for a later game that you've ever done? Of course, among things that you're able to talk about. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything, James? Uh, yeah, but you know, I'm still holding on to him. So if I tell you, it won't be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I, I mentioned one. Another, I can say one other little one that was goofy was uh, in our Aliens game, which I directed. We had this um, this character called Cooler Bot that we loved, and he's basically just a robot water cooler. 
and we had him animated and basically because that, that, that was a game where there's a lot of just stuff in the background like atmospheric stuff and we wanted him to be an npc where he would run up to you when your um colonial marine got near and then pour a cup of water from his belly and hold it out for you but there was no way to collect the water <laughs> and so you basically <laughs> just as you're walking around killing xenomorphs if you're in a hallway with cooler bot he would keep running up to you happily and offer you water that you couldn't take um <laughs> That was one that uh, it, I don't remember why we didn't put that in, but uh, but that was that's one that I can think of that that was on the cutting room floor. <laughs> I guess if I had to actually share one of them, uh, when we were working on Cat Girl without Salad Amuse Bouche, we had um, there's all the different genre guns. Uh, there was a few genres that we were trying to work in that just didn't make the cut. There just wasn't enough time to implement them, or we couldn't work out some small detail. But I'll tell you, that we had. Um, one of them was like a, a, a racing gun where you have like a little race car that would move around. Uh, but the my favorite that we couldn't get in was the dating sim gun. Oh, and cool. uh, we even had uh, a whole like script with the characters uh, interacting with each other. Um, that I think Adam, you actually stubbed out this whole script with like the different characters and like words that they could say and like, I like different choices. Yeah, uh, I, I, I remember it. Um, and it was very funny, uh, but we uh, we never got to realize the dating sim gun. So you know, if uh, we ever get to revisit Cat Girl Without Salad, we might have to work that one in. Yeah, the the, the pitch of Cat Girls basically it started as an April Fools, and then our fans kept bringing it up, and then we actually made like a little three stage version of it. Um, but the idea was it, like every game genre combined, and the way we pulled that off was we put them in her guns. So she has the RPG gun where she's doing Final Fantasy attacks. Right. She has the puzzle bobble gun where she's doing bust a move type stuff and i think the the game we released has six of them but yeah if we ever get a chance to do the full cat girl without salad that would be the goal to do like 20 or 30 guns so that every game genre you can imagine you could think of is is represented even i remember we were talking even like sports manager and train conductor and, and <laughs> obscure stuff like that <laughs> yeah that sounds pretty amazing overall um Shifting gears a little bit, I feel like we have to ask at least kind of one shot and take question considering we're all big fans here at, at the channel. Um, so it's, this is, I guess, more of a question for James. Uh, you know, you've worked on every game since Risky's Revenge. You know, from an insider's perspective, how do you feel the series has kind of changed and evolved over the years considering it started as a Game Boy Color game, then it went to DSI where and now it's getting, you know, full animated trailers and stuff? Yeah, um, it's really been incredible to be part of that journey. Uh, you know, uh, working with Matt Bozon, uh, creative director of Way Forward and uh, co-creator Sean Tay with his wife. Um, uh, I've been able to see that evolution and kind of take part of that process. And it's um, it's been interesting because I, I think the thing that I enjoy the most is that as we make more of these games, we have more opportunities to get a little more depth into the world and and get to know these characters even more. The you know the personality traits and the quirks of a character like Roddy Tops like that we can only communicate so much in Risky's Revenge. In the most recent game, the role of Roddy Tops I thought was uh, very fun and really uh, speaks to her personality as a character. Uh, and I won't spoil too much, but it's a uh, it's it's a very funny and, and amusing reveal. And it uh, I think that kind of opportunity to connect on a deeper level with these uh, characters as we create more games is one of my favorite things about how the series has evolved. But no doubt, there's just so many different ways, you know, from the, the fidelity of the visuals, uh, you know, trying new and different things with the, uh, the evolution of the gameplay, you know, the speed of the movement, the way you trigger abilities. These are all things that have evolved and changed and, uh, and continue to evolve and change the, the more we create. So. Those are the details that I think uh, have been a real pleasure to see evolve. Yeah, I can definitely tell over time that things kind of progressively get more and more detailed and more and more fleshed out, even just as someone who got to pick up and play the Game Boy Color game on the 3DS Virtual Store. I feel this is uh, something that everybody goes through at some point or another, uh, whether you're in content creation or game development. But uh, outside of your jobs and all that, it, can you guys ever turn off the developer side of you when you're just like playing games on your own in your downtime um i would say the creator side 
no. Um, the developer side, yeah. Um, I because uh, a lot a lot of what I do now, I think because so. I noticed that like a few years ago, I worked on a game, I think about five years ago, called uh, Till Morning's Light. And it's a really cool little horror game that we did for iPhone with Amazon. And um, it only really came out on iPhone and Android. And then because of compatibility issues, it got yanked. And so you can't play it now. And it's kind of a bummer because it was like one of our most ambitious, biggest games ever. And you, you just can't play it right now. And I remember the fact that we were doing more and more games back then that were not having boxes anymore and just being digital made me kind of think like oh gosh i did got to do something physical so so my outlet recently is is i tend to do more uh books on the side and i'm doing like children's books I'm, i've done like three of them so far and i'm working on some others um so that's i've gotten a little i've i've i guess relegated myself a little better so that now i'm can kind of turn off the game designer when i'm not doing the way forward stuff um and uh, and focus on other things but definitely from the perspective of can you turn off the creator can you turn off someone who i was always having to you know come up with ideas and stuff like that i would say no except i will say that it does and i learned this as i was working on my books there is a, a finite resource like there's a certain point at which if you're just non-stop creating and non-stop coming up with stuff you'll get to a point where your body just rejects it or at least i will where it's like i'll i'll have like eight hours of like you know writing plan i'll get two hours in and say nope i can't i just can't do it like my i'm totally tapped and it's just there's a well of creativity and i think if we too aggressively tap into that then sometimes you need to recharge and you know just veg out and you know watch netflix or something like that um but yeah i, I don't know if that quite answers you but yeah for me it's like i i, I can turn off like, I, I don't need to, I think, um, critique games as I play them. Like, I play Hades all the time. I'm not, you know, really thinking like, oh, they should have done this better. Or Look at that asset popping out or stuff. Like, I, I, I've gotten better at that. But from the creative side, yeah, I, 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 if I have a waking hour, I'm always working on something. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a perfect answer. I, I, I would, I'd like to add something, but it's just really just repeating what Adam said. I think we tend to... Uh, be in that creative mode when we can i call it the creative faucet it's flowing and i'm just trying to catch as much as possible uh but then you know there's times where it's like it's overflowing i can't catch everything i gotta kind of like recharge and reset and uh, like try to get out of that mode um you know it, it's it's never truly off that that designer in you is always going to be there thinking uh and wanting to create when we have the opportunity to though one thing i was interested about is um with shante half genie hero uh, part of the reason why that game was able to come to be was because of the Kickstarter campaign, which it's hard to believe that's, what, 10 years ago now that that Kickstarter campaign actually happened, mm -hmm. which seems like nonsense to, to me that time's passed like that. But um, I was wondering what kind of challenges crowdfunding adds to making a game that don't normally happen when you're making something and you're getting... Uh, funding through a more traditional sort of thing like a pub normal publisher or something like that yeah i mean anything where it's like um visible and known by everybody from the beginning there's just way more pressure so you know the best time that you're developing a game or the easiest time is before it's announced before you're like closing in on the deadline and so you know the fact that that at we had this game that was out there. Everybody knew how it looked from the demo from day one. It definitely, I think, put Matt and uh, and his team under more pressure than they would be if they were just developing something kind of in a vacuum like we typically are. And then, you know, what gets even trickier, which I've I've done personally Kickstarters for my my children's books, is people who have invested in you then feel a sense of ownership and so i remember that was something with uh, the half genie hero is you know you're not only making a game trying to uh meet everybody's expectations but you have these thousands of people saying hey i paid for that game where's my game or hey i paid for that game what if you do something like this or why aren't you doing more stuff like this like it's just it's a much more um uh taxing kind of uh, uh back and forth 
um, dynamic. Whereas I think most of the games that we do are sort of just kind of done quietly in a closet. And usually by the time we're announcing a game, you know, two or three months out from release, we're pretty much already done with it at that point. We're probably just, um, you know, an alpha beta state, like mopping up bugs and stuff like that. So we've already kind of done most of the creative stuff at that point. Um, I, but I can only imagine, and, and from, you know, uh, from what I saw from the, that experience and from what I've done on my own Kickstarters, even though they weren't games, it's, it's a lot more uh, pressure that you're under when you're doing something in a public spotlight, as opposed to in a traditional, um, you know, outside of the, the, the public kind of uh, uh, viewport uh, production for games. I certainly, it's, it's also kind of a fun experience to be able to share as you go along the way, you know, it certainly adds its challenges, but there, I, yeah, I always thought it was fun. Part. Yeah, it was all negative, yeah. but that's the problem. <laughs> I, I think it's fun, like, as we go to be able to see reactions, because when we're working on stuff in a vacuum, we don't get that, like, back and forth with the, the people, the audience that we're making it for, where they uh, can see it and react. Because uh, when we were working on Half Genie Hero, and we'd post, like, a Kickstarter update, and, like, uh, here's... Uh, here's like how the hypno baron looks or like whatever or here's an early access uh demo where you can try the game here's the new backer enemy we're gonna let you vote on roddy top's costume all that stuff like the energy of the fans was so energizing like along the way it was so motivating to get the reactions in real time as we were developing the game so for all the challenges that it has where we're developing a game and it's very difficult because now there's it's out there there's expectation on it it, it, it was, uh, and we're so thankful for just the number of backers on that project. That was just astounding. Just every single one of them were so thankful. Uh, but the, the f feeling that uh, as we went along the way, hearing the voice of the fans was just very motivating. I think that's also kind of an example of, and James and I are, you know, old friends and we've co-directed quite a few games, but I think yeah. this is also an example of, of our personalities. I'm like a very classic introvert and he's a, an extrovert. So I'm more of the <laughs> mindset of like, I'm creating, go away. And I think he's more like, I'm creating, come on in. <laughs> <And> so <Yeah. laughs> I, think it's true. I love you, but you exhaust me. <laughs> <laughs> Had a bit of a question for James. Uh, you also like to, uh, I looked on your website a little bit, you also say that you're very much an artist as well as a game designer. Kind of curious how those two kind of skills complement each other, or has there already been situations where the artist side of you kind of got in the way of the game designer side of you? Uh, no, I think so. it doesn't get in the way. It, it, it complements it. It's a, you know, it's a skill to be able to have. Um, I, yeah, so I'm always working on something, whether it's like uh, my way for current way forward project or if it's just like my you know occasionally i'll have like a weekend like project where every weekend when i'm not like on the clock doing way forward stuff i'm working on my own kind of personal craft whether that is a game you know adam adam's got his books and stuff he works on i do like a lot of just i you know my, my core is games you know so i i do like a lot of like little like side app games and projects some of them end up on consoles some on mobile some uh, I've even done just like, uh, I guess, installations and, and event-based stuff. All of these days, not so much of that, but event-based stuff and installations where you can go to a, a venue and for a limited time experience something. And so uh, I think that artist side is there. And that side that uh, I have in on the weekends where I'm working on those projects, all the stuff that I learned there, I think, ports over and folds in. And so I think a lot of the sensibilities that uh, you'll find in something like a, like a Kakro or Vitamin Connection are uh, ones that are fostered by uh, the the uh, kind of sense that I've tempered working on these other things. And when you look at the outside of WayForward stuff I've done, I think you can feel they still have a little bit of uh, that identity that you could see as like a WayForward identity. There's a little bit of crossover there. So um, I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, it, it very much does. It's you know, as someone who hasn't really worked on a game, I've always just kind of been curious, you know, does this aspect of something you like kind of not quite jive with the game development process, so. Sure, sure. I think, I think it informs it, yeah. I mean, because a lot of directors at WayForward are artists, but not 
either not at a professional level or just not working in that capacity. So, you know, for James and myself, like when we're on a smaller project, we're totally confident art directing ourselves. So on River City Girls, I was the art director. Sometimes we'll have dedicated art directors, but I was art director on that one because we had a small team. So having that artist sensibility is great because you can collaborate with people and you can do, you know, red line edits and say, make it more like this. And you can describe what you want and you can do sketches and stuff like that. But it's also kind of nice not to, have to be the person to actually create the art that, that's seen in the final game okay so this will be my final question but uh throughout the years uh, doing this thing with youtube for a living uh, i've met some uh, quite ambitious uh indie developers and game creators that are looking to uh get their name out there and this question is uh more so that they can listen in from your perspective as someone who's uh, folks have been part of a company that's turning 31 this year if it hasn't already turned 31 already i'm not sure uh is there any advice you can give to any sort of up-and-coming any developers that are trying to get their foot out the door just make games i mean everybody that i know that's in a lead position at way forward either the directors or the lead programmers or the art directors, like everybody who's kind of like leading one of the disciplines, the commonality is we all were just making games and making projects from a young age. We're all, you know, coming up with RPG stats and fictional games when we we're 10 years old. And then, you know, all had worked on hobby projects and stuff like that. So yeah, really the best thing you can do is start working on something you don't have to do everything i think that's a common misconception is like well i can't code or well i can't draw you, you can team up with people for sure um but get something made come up with a game be a part of a production and then get it done because it's really easy to start projects it's really hard to finish them and once you get a couple of personal projects under your belt and you know how to start and finish games um, it just becomes an experience thing and so that'll help you work at a place like way forward or that will help you you know make your own games independently i know when we look to hire people we're absolutely saying hey do you have any personal games or past projects you can show us so um yeah it's just uh you know do whatever you want don't feel like you need to do everything if you only want to code just code if you only want to animate there's plenty of coders looking for animators but get some projects and experience under your belt even non-professional ones because that'll absolutely help you as resume pieces and experience to, to get into the industry professionally yeah i think that's really the perfect answer if you want to make games just get started making games do it you don't you don't need to work at a, a game development studio to make games and these days it's easier than ever to pick up a tool like like a Unity or a Click Team Fusion or Construct or any of these tools out there and, and just start creating something. And if you can't do it all yourself, then uh, I, I think communication skills are key. Uh, be a strong communicator and communicate with other people, surround yourself with great people and uh, work together. You know, like if there's something you can't do, find uh, someone whose talent you respect that is a, uh, an equal and, and opposite to what you are, have to offer. Uh, unite and create something great together. I, I think that's uh, the best possible thing that you can do if you want to uh, get into the industry. And I was, I was going to piggyback on that and say, like, network. Like, just start connecting to people because you'll be amazed as you be become more experienced in game development, so will they. I have so many people where, you know, we all started hobby dev and then now we're all working for different industries and stuff. So, you know, it's, and, and it doesn't have to be in person, like the vast majority of artists and animators that that uh, James and I know, we know them mostly through Twitter or mostly through, you know, online or Discord or whatever. And so just, yeah, network, um, find out what communities are there are. Like early for me, I got really into Atari hobby dev. And so I was sort of like the one artist of the group. Everybody else is programmers, but I was always like, oh, let me do mock-ups for you and let me do art for you and helping them out with their projects. So yeah, network, meet people, connect with people collaborate with people and and above all else if you want to do games for a living you need to start finishing games as uh as early as possible even even tiny ones do like the smallest puzzle game in the world but finishing a game where then you can give the end result to somebody and say here you can play it um that's so critical to getting on your way in this in this profession much appreciate that answer thank you very much pretty sure got a couple of folks that would be happy to hear that 
Um, for my last question, it's actually just a pretty simple one. Uh, what would you say has changed the most about making games since you first started? I, I think uh, the technical constraints have changed drastically. I remember my first week working at WayForward. I was working on a working on a licensed game. Uh, it was a Looney Tunes. It was Duckamuck on uh, Nintendo DS and uh, Contra 4 in the same week. <laughs> If you could imagine, like just starting at a company, and those are the two games you're working on, like, um, uh, and I remember uh, one of the my early like jobs, the things I was doing was uh, palletizing uh, artwork, and so it, I'm gonna get a little technical here, but uh, back on the older consoles, you had a limited number of colors you could work with for a particular piece of artwork, so you had to make sure that all the artwork fit into these color constraints. And, uh, uh, well, long story short, I spent a lot of time making sure that a bunch of art was using correct color palettes and uh, all that stuff, fast forward to today, is like not a thing anymore. So, <laughs> did I did, you know, Jake, the, the did landscape I, has changed from... Uh, that's well, I was going to say, did I, ever, did I ever tell you that I, I, I did the, the palettization of the backgrounds in Contra? I had no idea. No, I didn't know this. <laughs> so yeah, like like what what James said, it's it was so technical. So it was like you had 256 colors, but they were in rows of 16 color. That was yep. 15 color plus one transparency, and you would have to force it into that stuff. And it was kind of satisfying because it was like doing that sort of stuff. You could tune your brain out, like you listen to music or you could have a conversation because all just like you know muscle memory stuff um yeah. but yeah i i kind of enjoy that stuff like james said it's all gone now <laughs> and so uh <laughs> that and then uh, I, I i was gonna say something similar which is um i think uh we're getting less limited and it's there's more tools easily accessible maybe this is more of a way forward thing for how we storytell and how we present stuff so like previously you know, because of the limitations, we can only do animations a certain way, or we can only do music a certain way. Now we can get really creative that like adding even just vocal songs, like which we would do a little bit of here and there. And then with games like Vitacon and River City, we just, you know, like kick the door down in terms of just how much like full on singing is in a game. That was something that you couldn't really do back when I was first starting at the company, everything was kind of in mod format and MIDI format and, you know, chip tuning and did, stuff like that. Or if it did, it would sound that. super compressed, right? It would sound exactly. just like kind of tinny. Yeah, so stuff like that, and like, like getting full VO in a game and getting full cinematics in a game and, and uh, or, or even, even something as simple as like when you play through River City Girls, there are no tile sets in that game. Just every scene is just illustrated, just like a massive drawing of just totally unique art by each artist. Like that's the kind of stuff we, we could not do technically on, on the older games. Good to hear that it gives you a lot more uh, creative freedom to kind of just do what you want. So uh, I think I'll end off with one Kind of more open-ended, uh, I guess a bit of a question, but also kind of a little bit of a discussion between kind of your thoughts on things. But, uh, you know, just, you know, we always ask you a lot of questions. Just kind of, is there anything you want to say to, you know, the fans watching this video? Because obviously anyone who clicked on this video is obviously interested in whatever you guys have to say. So as developers, is there anything you kind of want to say to all the fans out there? I, I all, uh, so since I'm the biz dev guy, I'll tease, I'll say the lineup of projects that we are doing now between licensed stuff and original stuff um because kind of like we're you know going back to the earlier question because we have more control over what we go after the lineup that we have now is insane like like the 2021 going into 2022 mostly 2022 i think lineup of way forward projects are just going to be absolutely mind-blowing in terms of like how did they get that license and how did they get to do a new game in that series and stuff like we're we're you know, we're, we're always uh, targeting kind of our dream brands and sometimes we get to do them like in the case of, uh, of a River City Girls, um, but we're really amping up the ratio of those in the next couple of years. All right, here oh, we go. The mummy, the, the mummy demastered, remastered. Let's go. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> Great, now, now you have me all excited for what's coming. <laughs> what, would you, what would you say, Jim? Uh, I mean, and, and that's all true. Um, I guess I just want to uh, give my thanks to the people that have supported us either, you know, from the old days on like uh, Game Boy and, and DS to uh, even people that just recently got into WayForward games. Uh, we appreciate you enjoying the 
the, the, the products that we create. And then I hope we can continue to uh, surprise and uh, delight players everywhere. Uh, we appreciate your, your, your fan art, your comments, the pictures of plushies you take and tweet at us. It's, it's, it's so uh, motivating and it puts a smile on our faces and we're, we're just so thankful for that. So uh, we appreciate your love. It is reciprocated and uh, I hope we can continue to uh, make you smile as well. Oh, and I have one more thing is um, we are actually in the process of getting more ways for fans to interact with us right now. So, um, right. you know, the first step is if you're on Discord, go ahead and join the Limited Run Games, our, our physical partner on many of our releases. Join the uh, Limited Run Games Discord, and there's a whole group of way forward channels there i'm in there james is in there you can ask us questions directly about half of the way forward directors are in there to chime in and we're looking into doing more stuff more you know things along the way of like twitch broadcasts and playthroughs and a lot of the fun stuff that we did a little bit like during the shantae kickstarter we want to get more of that going regularly so um yeah so hopefully uh, uh you know in the coming year you guys will be able to more directly interact with the way forward team and in, in a lot of cool unique ways oh, that's certainly great to hear i know i found a uh, kind of the ability to talk to you guys through that limited run uh, discord server so it certainly worked out so far um but yeah uh i think that's about all the time we had today i want to thank uh, adam and james so much for taking the time to talk with us today and answer our questions and just kind of be here and you know hanging out with us for a little while it means a lot to us yeah thanks for having us yeah we really appreciate it. it's a lot of fun all right. Thank you so much for joining, and uh, we'll see you in the audience in our next video. Thank you so much. Bye.